On Valentine's Day of 1990, at a distance of 3.7 billion miles from Earth, the Voyager 1 satellite sent back several stunning images of our little neighborhood of planets. To an untrained eye, the planets were nearly impossible to identify, appearing as nothing more than tiny pinpoints of light in a vast canopy of darkness. And then there was Earth. Due to the reflection of sunlight from the satellite, our little planet appeared as though it were floating in a sunbeam, a little blue speck, a truly breathtaking, never-before-seen image. The late planetary astronomer Dr. Carl Sagan said of this image of Earth, quote, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam." End quote. A historical moment in our exploration of the cosmos and our understanding of ourselves as a human species. In light of this faint image of our planet, what are we to make of ourselves? How fragile and precious life seems from this solitary vantage point. What then does our existence mean in the vastness of the universe? Dr. Sagan believed that it showed our humanity in relation to the cosmos to be inconsequential. Quote, a thin film of life on an obscure and solitary lump of rock and metal, end quote. But does our smallness mean we are inconsequential? Is human significance in the cosmos just a question of size or location? Does the question of our significance belong to the domain of science or philosophy, religion or metaphysics? How do we grapple with our own existence in light of what Voyager has shown us about our little biosphere? Is our existence in the cosmos meaningless? Are we forced to make our own meaning? And as Dr. Sagan asked in his PBS TV series, Cosmos, who speaks for Earth? There is a new book from the Sagan family that explores these very questions, written by Dr. Sagan's daughter, Sasha, titled, For Small Creatures Such As We. In the book, she continues the secular interpretations of our existence and the universe, her father espoused, while honestly grappling with the quest to find meaning and community without a belief in God. Sasha is a gifted writer and communicator and offers a candid look into her upbringing, her Jewish roots, exposure to Christianity as a child through her nanny, and her efforts in making secular traditions for her own family. As Sasha writes, quote, my parents taught me that the universe is enormous and we humans are tiny beings who get to live on an out-of-the-way planet for the blink of an eye. And they taught me that, as they once wrote, for small creatures such as we, the vastness is only bearable through love." End quote. So come and see what Sasha has to share about her new book, her remarkable parents, the universe, and how love bears her up through the vastness of the cosmos. Sasha Sagan holds a degree in dramatic literature from NYU. She has worked as a television producer, filmmaker, editor, and speaker, and her writing has appeared in New York Magazine, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, Violet Book, and elsewhere. For Small Creatures Such As We is her first book. You know, we met on Twitter and I was just like, there's no way she's going to be interested in doing a podcast oh. with me. <laughs> I'm so excited to do this. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No, it's wonderful. Uh, we will play this on the 9th of November. Uh, wonderful. Which, 
Saturday, which is uh, your dad's birthday, isn't it? Or no, Wait, when five. is your dad's birthday? Yeah, it's it's this the, Saturday, the isn't it? You're right. Yeah. Yeah, so she our, would be 85. Yeah. Our, our book club is going to be uh, meeting on Saturday. That's so lovely. Oh, that's perfect. No. So we're meeting on your dad's birthday, which is really cool. That's really nice. This is going to be sort of a just a way to talk about your dad and your book and Pale Blue Sky. Great. And uh, we we understand that not everything that your dad has written that you will be responsible for answering. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just, you know, it's funny. I actually, there was a lot of my parents' work that I didn't read for a long time because I liked this idea of having some part of him in the future. And I still haven't read everything, but I've read the 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 big ones now. Um, but a lot of I waited really until the last couple of years and um, it was like, I don't know, there was something about it where it was like, I, I found it really reassuring the idea that there were still words and ideas of his that were still in the future for me, which there still are because I haven't read everything, yeah. but I got, right. I got a lot of the, the really iconic books uh, read in the last, last couple of years and that felt good, although it was, you know, emotional. Yeah, no, I, one of the things, Sasha, I wanted to just thank you for because I've been a, a fan and a, a critic of your dad's writing for all of my adult life. Uh, your dad mm -hmm. got me into the interest in, in the universe when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was 12 when Cosmos came out. So mm -hmm. I was inspired by him to, to get into astronomy. Uh, I didn't have the science brain, but one of the things that your book did for me, uh, for small creatures such as we, which is you, you have a wonderful gift of writing and I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. Gosh, that's really kind of you to yeah. say. You say in, uh, I think it's on page 117, you said something about a book being a window into another person's life. And I think that's mm. what your, your book, I mean, kudos to you for being so vulnerable with what you shared, you know, because there's a, Thank you. there's a dialectical tension, obviously there that you're trying to still work out as a new parent, um, mm -hmm. having an iconic father and mom and all the things that you have to deal with there. Uh, it was really a wonderful, I thought very vulnerable. And I really appreciate that. And the other thing Thank your book you. did for me was um, put your dad in a human context because, you know, there's yeah. your dad, the planetary scientist, your dad, the philosopher, your dad, the son, you know, all of the cultural iconic things that come with that. But your book reminded me that there was, you know, Carl, the dad. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it really put a human face on it for me. And uh, I really just love to hear this story. One of my favorite stories in the book was you talking about your nanny. You want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So. The third adult in our household when I was little was Maruha Farhe, and she was um, my nanny, and she was amazing, and I loved her, and we had a really close relationship. She lived with us from the time I was six weeks old until I was eight, and then she came back for many, many summers after that. Um, she's gone now, but she was an amazing person, and she was um, a very devout Roman Catholic and she didn't drive. So my mother and I would drive her to church every Sunday and pick her wow. up. And um, her priest, Father Tony, often came to dinner at our house. And I remember him well. Um, and she had been, um, she grew up in Peru um, and she had been a, a cloistered nun in the Andes Mountains um, uh, for many years. And I tell the story in the book of how she left the convent, which I'll, I'll leave for readers. Um, yeah. But uh, it wasn't because of a loss of faith at all. She mm. was a true believer her whole life, um, very devout. And there was no or, you know, censorship about that in my house. I knew what she believed. She told me her theology regularly. We only spoke Spanish to each other. And I understood her beliefs. She took me to church when we were traveling, especially she would take me to church um, with her, which I loved because I like very ornate, fancy places with high ceilings where yeah. people are dressed up. And mm -hmm. um, I really like, I mean, a lot of the theme in the book is like, I really like special occasions and I really yeah. like, um, you know, settings where people are getting together and thinking about stuff and talking about stuff. So I loved, I loved that. And, you know, because she was very open with me um, about what she believed, and I knew that it was different than what my parents believed at a certain point, I started, you know, I, I had started thinking about this in sort of a philosophical sense. And I was, you know, kind of, I would say, a morbid <laughs> child in certain ways. Yeah. And um, 
I one day, you know, I was really interested in the question of death, not really in a, I mean, not in like a, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't think of it as a creepy way. Maybe if you came upon me when I was six years old, you would think it was creepy. But I just was like, this is really astonishing that we're all walking around animated, you know, and mm -hmm. then the animation will leave us. And this is just the most, um, I mean, I still think it's one of the most astonishing things about life is that mm -hmm. it ends. Mm -hmm. And so I one day went to my parents and I said, you know, um, Maroha says that when you die, you go to heaven and you're with God. And you guys say it's like you're asleep forever without dreaming. Mm -hmm. Who, <laughs> who pray tell um, is right. And my parents together, like joyfully um, in unison, said, nobody knows. Mm. And that was so meaningful to me because it was so honest, I thought. Mm -hmm. And because it wasn't that they were saying, you know, um, that they had total, you know, that they had hard total evidence that it was one way or the other, um, but that we have to, I mean, a lot of what I talk about in the book and a lot of what my parents taught me was this idea of um, how ambiguity mm. and sitting with the discomfort of not knowing the answer to a question. And sometimes it's an answer we will all get, as in this case, and sometimes it's an answer that you can answer as soon as you get to Google, you know, and sometimes it's a question that we might never get the answer to. But I it really it was so it was so lovely that they that that was their answer. And it was it, it really showed me also that it's OK to say, I don't know, um, mm. which is something that they really encourage even though, you know, both really brilliant people who had a lot of answers. My mother mm -hmm. still still does um, have a lot of answers to to really big questions and, you know, just also the really ordinary everyday questions. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I would ask. Um, a question that they didn't know the answer to, not necessarily like a huge philosophical question, but you know, what year did whatever, you know, the city of Albany be, was founded or something like that. I don't know, just the idea of like any question that I could ask without, um, with where they said, we don't know, let's look it up. It was such a joyful thing. Um, and I never got a, you know, like stop asking questions or like, right. just have is or something like that. So it really was really wonderful. And, and it taught me that there's shame in saying, no, we don't know. Yeah, it, it was wonderful to, to hear you talk about the openness of your uh, your exposure to Christianity and to Judaism. You dis, you describe in detail your Jewish background, um, yeah. your dad's Jewish background, your mom's Jewish background, um, mm -hmm. and your familiarity with uh, with Judaism and Christianity just growing up. Um, I was struck by that because, especially in the last 10, 15 years with a lot of resurgence of, you know, what we call new atheism or just athe the interest in atheism in general, the cultural resurgence of atheism, uh, a lot of people would oftentimes try to claim your father for the, 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 the atheist camp, if you will. Um, do you, would you mind clearing up some basic misconceptions from both, you know, believers and non-believers about how your father perceived religion, spirituality, and his attitude toward it. Sure. I mean, so Judaism in particular, you know, I mean, I, anything really. I mean, lots of people have secular Christmas and, you know, Christian holidays that they do in a secular way. But Judaism in particular, I think, sort of because Jewishness can be cultural mm -hmm. and ethnic as mm -hmm. well as religious, um, it sort of lends itself to being secular. And, you know, um, if, you know, if you don't believe, obviously, if you believe, it lends itself to being, you know, a monotheistic religion, yeah. um, but I, um, you know, we I often think you know, science and humanism they don't you know there's no recipes there's no mm -hmm. song, you know there's not mm -hmm. um, this stuff that when there's no you know holidays and human beings need those things and we want to feel connected to our ancestors. I mean, I think that's very common and I don't think you need to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I really, you know, I don't share the theology that my great grandparents had, but I feel connected to them and I want to carry on 
some of their traditions and honor them in a way that's meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my dad, I mean, he, you know, famously said, um, I don't want to believe, I want to know. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I think I describe myself as secular because um, atheism has a connotation of, you know, staunch total conviction and militance that I don't mm -hmm. necessarily ascribe to. Mm -hmm. And agnosticism has this connotation like you don't care, you know, like, oh, I'm agnostic, yeah. like I'll go either way. And I really right. care. It's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. So right. I, I really um, uh, think of myself as secular and my philosophy is, um, you know, it's, it's the same as my parents and the same as um, the way that my father raised me, which was my parents raised me, which was that belief requires evidence. And mm. so I just try to sit in that place where I withhold belief without evidence and say, you know, if more, if there's more information in either direction, I will, I will go where the evidence leads me. But until then, I think there's so much, and this is really what the book is about. There's yeah. so much that is provable and verifiable that is worthy of celebration and is meaningful and can give us that spine tingling thrill that makes us feel connected to each other and to the universe. Mm -hmm. You have a, you, you, your book, I think uh, I liked it because of its honesty in terms of you looking for creating meaning and tradition for your, your family as a new mom. Um, one of the things that you said early on in the book, uh, let me see if I can get it here. Um, I really kind of, it really kind of was, it was really interesting to see you say it, uh, where you said, I'm going to fumble here looking for the page. I no, had mark here, um, at the bottom of page 16, you said some new secular scientific tradition would mm -hmm. undoubtedly borrow from theistic ones. Yes. For example, throughout this book, I have found it impossible not to use the language of belief. So could you maybe that is that something that you learned from mom and dad? It seems like because as I read as I read Pale Blue Dot, we're reading it this month, it seems like one of the things reading your dad's book and your book together made me see more clearly maybe was was there's some Jewish root in your dad's writing. Oh, for sure. And I mean, cultural, I mean, this is the thing. So monotheistic religions, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they are all existing on top of, you know, polytheistic and what sometimes gets called pagan religions and the hol timing of the holidays and the traditions. Right. Mm -hmm. They're all whatever we don't. It's like it's kind of like the apple pie. You know, you can't start a, um, a belief system from scratch. And like, you yeah, know, it's hard. Saturnalia, right. You know, the Romans were really attached to Saturnalia and, and or the, the Bacchanal. Solstice, yeah, exactly. And their winter solstice holidays. And so when when they became Christian, you know, they they extended some of those traditions into into the Christian holidays, and that's normal. But in terms of language, I just think, you know, English is missing some words, um, a mm. lot of words probably, but specifically, you know, spiritual is a perfect example. I mean, magical from the Magi, right? All of these words that we use, sacred, holy, of course they come from theism because that's our history as, you know, English speaking, you know, the history of the English language it comes from that world. And so um, it's really hard to describe it without borrowing that language. Mm. Um, but I think the feeling that you feel, I don't know, when you see new images from, um, you know, Hubble or the images of the black hole, or when there's a new, or like DNA evidence. I mean, that's one of the things that just gets me every time. Every time I see an ancestry.com, commercial um and there's you know someone saying i didn't know this about my great great grandmother yeah and now I do and it's because of science that you know they are connected or i found my long lost cousin or i was adopted and then i found out what my you know history of my family was all of these things that are so i mean like the, that feeling of like the emotional um, reaction that that evokes, that feeling of being part of the, the, the world, part of the universe, part of the species. Um, I don't 
don't have a great way of describing that that doesn't invoke theism, even though it's not a theistic experience for me. But that mm -hmm. that feeling of like, you know, I mean, even revelation, right? You have we have these mm -hmm. scientific revelations, and it's so hard right. not to talk about it. Like it's not. Um, but this is the thing. I I really think that for most of human history these things were connected. The more deeply we could understand, and I write about this in the book, um, the more deeply we could understand nature, the more deeply mm. we could understand, this, you know, the movement of the stars in the sky and right. um, the changing of the seasons and which, you know, plants bloomed at what time of year and what the weather was going to be, all of these things that for since for our entire history, we've been trying to figure out and get the hang of partly for survival but also because it's really meaningful to us, I think, in an emotional way too. Yeah. Um, but for most of history, the more we understood those things, the more that was not divorced from our idea of our God or gods. And I think that um, you know, there's there's still some of that in 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 us where mm. those 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 things are. Um, it's just sometimes we have conflict when um we get different you know when when there's different uh philosophies and yeah, there's, sure, there's sure. contradictions and then we get really we get we have some some tension <laughs> in our so, species i loved what you talked about your uh dayanu tradition with dayanu yes dayanu so yes. i just wondered how to pronounce that uh, I looked, I had to look up online. I found some catchy songs, but that is a really catchy song. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So it seems like it seems so there's a lot more. There was a lot more openness to uh, to the religious tradition in your household growing up than maybe a lot of people. I did not even realize how. Oh, yeah. I mean, much no your, your, censorship. No yeah. censorship. I mean, I had, a, as I write in the book, I had a, like a wooden Noah's Ark and I like kept it on just I mean, like I, it, there was yeah. no censorship in terms of religion, certainly not. My parents, in fact, thought that my education would not be complete if I didn't understand religious mm. traditions and, you know, these um, very, you know, these elements that are central to civilization in Judaism and Christianity in Islam and in, but this in the same way, you know, Greek mythology and Roman mythology um you know m my parents thought it was really important to learn that and that i would not be an educated person if i if i didn't have access to all of that information yeah that was so wonderful to, to learn about your upbringing there because i i think i had a, a very wrong impression of that you know maybe there was more of a prohibition against uh never no my parents but it, but it, like really they censored very little <laughs> great was, no that's really that's really encouraging to know now um a bit about if you want to demure that's fine but yeah yeah uh, a bit about uh contact you are alexandra in the preface correct? yes that yes is, you, you sasha want to... is the russian sasha is the russian diminutive for alexandra my father's father was born in ukraine um yeah. so we i was i i my my real name is alexandra but everyone calls me sasha that's great. How did you get Sasha? How did that come from? Uh, they always called me that. And there was like a period of time, probably which, like when I was like in third grade, where, and I, we lived in, you know, like, you know, it was like the 80s. And I was like, I really want like pencils and barrettes and little <laughs> tiny license plates with my name on it. And they don't, uh -huh. I don't, I can't get any with my weird Russian name. And <laughs> so I went through like a period of time where I made everyone call me Alex. Um, and some of my friends from home, because I still have the best friends I always have had. Some of the boys still call me Alex. They just they're like, we're not we're not switching back. Um, but mm -hmm. everybody else calls me Sasha. But yeah, I mean, it's it's um, my family from I mean, they they called me Sasha from when I was born. I think it, it, they felt like Sashi is like a little like, you know, cute name for a baby. Whereas yeah, like, yeah. Alexandra was very like that yeah. <laughs> or even Alex very adult for a little baby right well that was really cool to know because i didn't know for the, i like contact i really do and i actually like the book better than the movie so uh your mom yeah. and dad worked well, that, on it i feel like that happens with books and movies the yeah books, you know and your mom and dad worked on this together is that correct absolutely they, so they they started out they wanted it to be a movie they they saw it as a movie mm -hmm. 
And you know, movies take a really long time to make, yep. um, some more than others, but this one took 18 years. Wow. And um, from when they started working on it till it premiered, and um, my dad died while while they were in production, so he never oh, saw I didn't know the that. movie. Yeah, oh. and it premiered in the summer of, of 1997, and he died in December of 96, mm. so he never saw it. But um, the not in the like while they were trying to get this movie made, um, you know, because it's like a movie takes thousands of people. It's an amazing thing. It's mm. like. It is, it's just, I mean, it takes thousands of people, you know, in production, but also just to, to get it funded, to get it greenlit. It's just such a long process. Anyway, so in the time it took, um, they wrote the novel and, um, and yes, they, everything that they wrote when, in the time that they were together, they wrote together. And, you know, um, it's, 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 it's really interesting because as I write the, the title of my book, comes from a line in, in contact yes. and um, it's actually a line that my mom wrote um, and mm. it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It, it, that's one of my favorite lines that your father has ever written but with the, the love. The, yeah. Um, in our, but just this is an aside. Uh, yeah. I, I, the book that I co-authored and edited, we both, I noticed as I was reading your book, you mentioned the Subaru and the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. I did, I did too in my introduction. Talk, talk. Oh, that's so funny. So that was fun. Um, but um, in relation to contact, I had a couple of thoughts that sort of came together as I was reading your book. And one of them, uh, this goes along with what you said at the end of page 235, which I thought was uh, wonderful. Oh, I have my talking about, here. Yeah, there it. you go. So <laughs> you're, <laughs> you wanted to, you were talking about uh, a wonderful paragraph there at the end, the second mm. paragraph. Maybe at the stroke of midnight, on the longest night of the year, we imagined we'd slip into our room gently wake them up by whispering into their little ears we have something wonderful something epic something thrilling to tell you something so large and magnificent that no human being can stop it uh, you know starting tomorrow the days will get longer again and slowly the plants will bloom again and the sunshine will return and summer is coming and that's so hopeful yeah. and it's so it's so touching but it, it reminded me precisely of the last couple of chapters of contact where mm -hmm. especially especially moving is where ellie you know meets her her you know father um yes in a way right yeah in a way you know uh mm -hmm. he had called her from the stars and she had come it was this it was as if her father had these many years ago died and gone to heaven and finally by this unorthodox route she had managed to rejoin him and she sobbed and embraced him again and i thought there was a wonderful correlation between the the kind of hope you express in your book and the kind of hope that your dad seemed to have where you touch upon this concept of immortality and, and being reunited again. And there seems to yeah. be that, that dialectical tension in your writing and the writing of your father, where you have this sort of hope of immortality well, in one sense, but what do you, you always speak I, to that? I, I don't want to read into way. it. No, no, no. I think of it this way. You know, it's, it's, this is a major theme in the history of our species. Yeah. This, uh, and we have, have such I was talking about my sort of fascination with death as a child but I think that that is I mean that goes across our entire species through the, throughout the history of time maybe other species too it's 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 the thing we wrestle with the most mm. and it's so difficult not to you know it's so difficult to tolerate the ambiguity yeah it's hard to sit with the not knowing it's so hard it's so hard and of course of course, our desires, our deepest desires are that we're going to see, I mean, as I, as I write, my dad told me, you know, he wished more than anything that he would see his parents again, mm. but he had no evidence um, to suggest that he would. Mm. And I think that, you know, of course, we, we miss the people we love when they die. That is so real and true and human. Um, and I guess my perspective is, that the hope like the idea that the only hopeful scenario is that we're reunited that i don't subscribe to that i i think there's another hopeful scenario mm. which is that we learn to be so present and so appreciative in the moment when we are together and show the, each other the love that we really feel and um enjoy being together that when it's over, it feels like it was enough. 
Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, you know, I think in some sense, Dante had it right. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a, a good perspective on the cosmos when he said that the love that moves the sun and other stars, mm -hmm. you know, the, the end of Paradisia there. Right. Um, that's also such a human. I mean, that's a that's because we're human beings. And so we think yeah. our feelings are very important. But in the grand scheme of the universe, you know, from an outsider's perspective, they might not seem as important to another species and sure. you know if we if we were not here um the you know the 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 celestial bodies would keep going yeah yeah one of the things that we when we talked about uh when, when your dad one of of course one of his most famous quotes is his reflection on earth from uh, yeah. voyager um, yeah, that. yeah that he's gotten a lot of uh i'm sure he's gotten a lot i don't know how much I'm sure your mom tells you, and you know how much feedback he has gotten from from that positive and negatively. Can you can you give a little personal aside about how how that quote impacted your father, the reception that he oh. got and the feedback, and how, I mean, how did that play? You mean like um, I, I mean it's funny because the the vast majority, and what of course obviously people aren't going to are very rarely come up and tell me um, something that they really disagreed with about yes. my father's work but from from um my understanding i mean and the way i see it is this this beautiful call to peace and to understanding for one another and that the differences between our cultures and our belief systems are so minuscule and so tiny and petty and the, the conflicts that we have that we're willing to destroy one mm -hmm. another over are just the, the most surface things, um, uh, unimportant things compared to the idea that we have this little home in this great vastness and we are in it together no matter what. And I mean, the idea of looking at that little dot and realizing that um, in all this vastness, here we are together and the, the idea of the things that we're ready to kill our, each other over um, on this planet, it's uh, it's abhorrent, and and we have to find a way to uh, to see ourselves as um, united on this little lifeboat in this enormous ocean of space. Indeed, we have a we have a, a duty to be a humble and, and to love one another for sure. Absolutely. With the reflection, one of the things that I know I've struggled with. This is just me, and I know um, is the idea of you know, the, the wonders of the scientific advance with Hubble and, and of course, with Voyager. Yeah. And your mom and dad met working on Voyager. Yeah. Golden. Is that correct? That yes. They, yeah. Uh, no, they didn't. Hold on. No, they met. They had already met, but they fell okay. in love while they were working on it. Together. Okay. And one of your brothers is on the record. Is yes, that true? Yes, my brother, Nick. My half brother, Nick, Nick is, um, who's an amazing writer, um, science fiction writer. Um, he is, he says, Hello from the children of Earth. That's, That's right. Really it was cute. Nick. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Um, so with the idea that we're talking about science and love and tradition, uh, in Pale Blue Dot, your dad spends a few chapters talking about, you know, human significance. And here's one thing where I saw a little bit of uh, Jewish secular mix, a, a sort of dialectical tension between, uh, you know, our cosmic significance, meaning in life, that the, the, the meaning of love and, and everything that's important to us, the significance of that versus looking at our smallness and saying that we are insignificant so there's there's obviously the, the picture of our smallness um but in relation to the question of significance it, it's, it's as your dad saw it is that something that he derived philosophically or it was more a scientific reflection or how did he come about to, to... i don't think that there's any like i don't i guess scientifically and philosophically like those are one thing to me i think and to my dad like his philosophy was science and sure like cultural traditions that were jewish and things that you do to say it's springtime like passover opposed yeah. to doing you know that's that's one thing but in terms of actual worldview and philosophy um science was the root of that and like you know we're significant to ourselves mm -hmm. as a species right. and we but i think that's a different question you know if we feel like you know love our love for one another is really meaningful and important. I think that's beautiful and that's great, but I don't think that that means it's like 
um, universal. You know, it just means that this is what we do on this little planet at this little moment. Um, mm. And maybe that's totally great and wonderful and that's enough for us. But I don't, yeah, and I, I mean, for me, I think it is. I don't think it has to be, you know, universal. I don't think that yeah. it has to, it's just, this is what, this is how my, um, is how we've evolved. Um, and it's a, it's a great evolutionary advantage to get along with the other members of your species. And we are, you know, sometimes we're terrible at it and um, sometimes we're really good at it. And, you know, that's how we raise our young and we live in communities and we, that's how we get along and that's how we make more of ourselves. Um, and I don't think that that means that it's, the singular way to be in the universe. We just don't have any other evidence about how to be on other planets um, or, you know, in out in the multiverse. But um, I think that, you know, we're always going to look at, at everything through our very narrow lens of being yeah. our particular creatures in our particular place. And that's okay. But I think like anything, you know, we, we should be self-aware. It's like if you I don't know if you live in a country and you've only ever been in that country and you only speak that language and the way you see the world is filtered through that lens, you know, that's okay. But just we have to be aware that it's not the same for all the other right. points of view, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, I think you do a great job of, uh, like your dad did, bringing together some cultural traditions from, from other parts of the world, which is really good. It was really neat how you did that. And it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, um, a collection of how you sort of weave all that together and that's that's hard as a writer i know that's hard to do where you have so many disparate parts feeding into to, to try to weave a singular narrative but that's what i couldn't believe was the more i read and researched the more clear it seemed to me that the things that we celebrate and the things that are meaningful to us and when we celebrate and how we celebrate are so similar around the world and throughout time mm. and sure it's not every single holiday and it's not every sure. single ritual but there are these huge themes um and it was just amazing to me that if you sort of peel back the specifics of time and place you know and like individual groups you know their theology or lore we just all have these touchstones you know the solstices and equinoxes birth coming of age death um, you know, they're just, it's amazing how, how often we found, you know, even disparate cultures who had no way of communicating thought this, this is the stuff that's really meaning that, um, we should be marking and we should be making rituals for yeah. And I think it's because, you know, my mother always says there's no refuge from change in the cosmos. And no, she does. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's like, well, that's a lot to process all the time is this constant yeah entrances and exits you know babies are born people die children become adults this is some, you know, the seasons change it's exhausting and it's really yeah, emotional it right <laughs> you know right and right so we've all created these ways of of processing this information and coming to terms with these changes so i know we're going to get some I, okay. I, we got a couple of questions that we want to oh, get yes. to here in a minute uh, from our from our uh, atheist christian book club members yes uh, i want it's to so kind of cool lead in you, wait sorry can i just ask no, go ahead. how did you start the book club it's so cool and like how does it work and oh do yeah you, do you go back and forth on which kind yes of we uh, you do? so we spend a month we, we we meet once a month usually the first friday of every month and we'll read a christian book or uh, something related to theism, and then we'll read a, an atheist or a secular book, something related. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be strictly hardcore atheist. We can read something non-Christian. Right. Um, but generally, we like the polarizing works that get one side or the other, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very civil. Uh, there's 15 to 30, sometimes upwards of 40 people that come. Uh, you can see Amazing. it on Facebook, uh, Atheist Christian Book Club on Facebook. We broadcast live, so you'll be able to see I have uh, never had a Facebook account in my life. But oh my goodness! Have to tell okay. me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so when it's done, we'll I'll, we'll post the video and I can share it with you. And Perfect. We'll okay, that's um, great. But we've been doing this for a couple of years, um, and we have a meal, and uh, we sit down, we talk to each other. Um, you know, nobody has. I don't think there's been any official conversions one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> that you know of. That, that you know. I know of, but we do. 
we do sit down face has to face anyone, with people. Have any two people fallen in love from opposite sides? Uh, I'll have to ask James about that. I don't know exactly. <laughs> not, that, not that he knows. Uh, right, but, not that uh, you know of, right. Maybe, who knows. Um, but uh, so it's, it's phenomenal. We're just now starting to get traction and people are catching on to this. And every time uh, James or Brady, who run the program, go out and talk to churches about it, they're like, what? What do you do? How, how does that work? It's, it's the so most amazing great. thing. People, people are like, what, what in the world? So uh, just leading into this, so so my little pet question would be, and, and this is not to, to debate, this is just no, for, I'm, you, I'm for you to share. To <laughs> okay, okay, we can do that too. Um, I don't mind, I don't okay. mind. <laughs> First though, I have to tell you that my, my funnest part in your book was you getting into the taxi cab with your husband and yes. singing, the, <laughs> singing the alphabet song with the taxi driver. That was it great. was amazing and he really did something very meaningful for us. I keep waiting for somebody else to say, oh yeah, I was in, you know, I was in DC and I just, I can't imagine that he just out of, you know, years of doing his job, he just picked the two of us to sing to. He must do it all the time. Someone else <laughs> out there must have been in yeah. his past. But he was a really lovely person and he gave us a gift, truly. And I mean it, it's been this month, it's six years and we sing the alphabet song every freaking weekend. That's awesome. <laughs> amazing and now we have a two-year-old so it's like a little less weird well that's but that's really it's cool it's really cool it really okay, was so, great that you did okay sorry go on yeah, but i i blew new york i was thinking yeah, cab yeah, you were yeah, from yeah, new york yeah. in dc yes, yes, yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. yeah that's where i got it all mixed up <laughs> but uh but that was that was great yeah um so my 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 question is maybe for you and i know your your answer for your father will will be dependent or subjective in a sense but um for for you or, or dad how come the universe didn't count as evidence for uh, the existence of God. Because that there's not. Well, how would why would it? I mean, that's it, I mean, it to say, well, the universe has to be created by something or someone. Well, mm. but then did God have to be created by someone or something? Yeah, that's the that's the sometimes that's the question that gets asked a lot. But in a in a Judaic Christian sense, of course, you guys know that God generally is not viewed as being created Himself. But I know that right. That, but so why why can't that be? Why couldn't that? I'm not saying that that's my view, but why couldn't that yeah. be true to the universe? Well, I think in in for me scientifically, you have the option between sort of the universe or the cosmos existing forever, being eternal or infinite. So okay. you have these terms. And this is what I think, you know, you talk about in your book, the idea of using the, the theistic terms, because I think infinite and eternal in terms of matter, um, knowing that matter and energy is infinite and, etern and eternal is something that you kind of have to assume like God is eternal. So one way or the other, we assume either. But, the you, but, but you have to assume God is eternal. Yes. I mean, I mean that's there's... Where you're that's, I guess, where I, we part ways. Yeah, that, that, that the question that boils down to, do I have, I, for lack of, just being colloquial, for lack of a better term, just yeah. is the universe, do I believe by faith that God is eternal and created the universe, or do I believe you know, by faith that the universe has always been or is eternal because nobody was no, around? No, 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 no. There's a third way, which is just, there is. We, don't, we don't know. We don't have enough information, okay. but we don't have, I'm not saying that the no, universe it, is eternal. I'm just saying, as we get closer to understanding that how this started, we may have more information, but that we have to sit with the ambiguity because to me saying, well, I know by faith that God is, you know, eternal, that doesn't fit in to me trying to understand scientifically how we got here and what, how this all started. Yeah. Right. No, and I'm not advocating that we say God is eternal and stop doing science. I wouldn't. That's some people okay, might say. So but science no, I, requires that we just keep looking for the evidence, and when we don't have enough, we just sit with the ambiguity until we have more. Okay. But to right. rather than put something in that comes from a religious tradition, um, in the place of an answer that we don't have yet. Yeah, that a lot of people will say that would be like the God of the gaps. Well, we don't know how mechanistically the universe came to be, so therefore God. But I think. Well, but there are so many things that were theological that we had these theological answers for, like mental illness, or like earthquakes, or like, you know, um, uh, all sorts of plagues and uh, crops going bad, and all of these things that for our history um, as a species, we. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what happened, and, and and those things over time 
have moved from the theological spiritual explanation to a science scientific explanation i mean you know tectonic plates like once we got that we stopped feeling like we were being punished when there was an earthquake i mean maybe not everyone but fewer people felt that way right right um right. and i just think um more things will move from column a to column b over time and what i hope is that we can still have a sense of awe and majesty oh, yes. about them the way we do, you know, when you're in like a really wild thunder and lightning storm, even if you're a meteor, I mean, you see it all the time, meteorologists who are scientists who are, are you know, totally obsessed with weather and honor this science by studying it and chasing it and obsessing with it. You see it with them. They have the same, I mean, just because they're one of the, kinds of scientists who are on TV the most. Um, yeah, right, right. They're like awe and wonder. And I mean, it feels like kind of a spiritual thing. And I think that's so great because to understand something more deeply, how it works, shouldn't rob the splendor and beauty of it. Oh, no, and no, not so, that. We agree. We agree. Absolutely. If you if you figure yeah. out internal combustion engines, it's they're still pretty cool. Um, so yeah. My, uh, <laughs> I want to, we want to go into a question from one of our, I think oh, great. James. Uh, James is the president of our book club and of Watchman Fellowship. And awesome. he has, Hi, James. he has a, uh, a, a, th these are recorded for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, but James actually pulled a clip from your mom reading from Pale Blue Dot. Oh, great. So he has. Hey, Sasha, thanks so much for taking a few moments of your time to talk with us at the Atheist and Christian Book Club as we discuss your father's book, Pale Blue Dot. And on page 332 of his book, uh, your dad quotes Charles Lindholm, who's a professor of anthropology at Boston University. And, and he quotes uh, the professor saying, in modern Western society, the erosion of tradition and the collapse of accepted religious beliefs leaves us without a telos or an end to which we strive, a sanctified notion of humanity's potential. Bereft of a sacred project, we have only a demystifying image of a frail and fallible humanity, no longer capable, capable of becoming God-like creatures. Then your father makes an interesting comment of, about Professor Lindholm's quote, uh, as narrated by your mother. I believe it is healthy indeed essential, to keep our frailty and fallibility firmly in mind. I worry about people who aspire to be godlike. But as for a long-term goal and a sacred project, there is one before us. On it, the very survival of our species depends. If we have been locked and bolted into a prison of the self here is an escape hatch something worthy something vastly larger than ourselves a crucial act on behalf of humanity peopling other worlds unifies nations and ethnic groups binds the generations and requires us to be both smart and wise it liberates our nature and, in part, returns us to our beginnings. Even now, this new telos is within our grasp. Uh, my question is this, Sasha. Do you, do you think that your father's uh, this vision of peopling other worlds and his call for a human future in space, maybe in some ways, uh, may have been an attempt to create a transcendent purpose, uh, a hope for some type of immortality, if not for him personally, for humanity, humankind as a whole. It's a matter of survival a little bit longer, because even if we don't destroy ourselves and we manage to move, you know, to another mm. planet that's habitable and lovely, um, and we are not here when in five billion years the sun um, implodes and makes it very, uh, I mean, impossible to stay. Right. Um, we still, it won't be immortality because our species will evolve and we will change into something else. Sasha, thanks and so much for this. Oh, wait. <laughs> we <laughs> That's will okay, change go ahead. Into the other side. 
I'll go back a little so you can edit. Um, <laughs> I, I used to be a TV producer, so I, <laughs> I know. Um, Sorry. So even if we make it possible for us um, to leave this this world and and you know move to another planet that's habitable mm -hmm. and lovely, and we are not here on this on this planet and this solar system when the sun in five billion years ish. Um, implodes and, and makes it not very nice to stay. Um, wherever we are, we we will evolve eventually into something else. And we mm. will become a species that no longer reveres what we revere. Um, we will, our values will change, our um, ideas will change, and we will not be recognizable. I mean, not we, they will, will not recognize us um, as their brethren, I mean, will they carry maybe some of the, the genetic material? Sure, um, but there, to me, I mean, is it immortality if we would not recognize them as part of us? I don't think so. But I also think that survival, you know, that's, that is the driving force of so much of what we do as a species. And it's, it's, I mean, it's central to to our behavior and to what we value. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of what I write about is the idea that even if it's all chance and chaos and nothing happens for a reason, the fact that any of us are alive right now is worthy of celebration and wonderful. Mm. And so, yeah, I think being alive is great. And I think it would be wonderful if we could you know, make it possible to, to, to survive a little longer. But I think that's different than immortality. Mm, mm. Did you and your father share a kind of, how did he, growing up, um, obviously he was, you know, a planetary scientist primarily. How did he get you interested in um, how, he was obviously passionate about what he did. And how did yeah. he convey his, how come you didn't, uh, my, basically my question yeah. is, how come you didn't follow dad in the science route? Well, that's so funny. It's 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 like um, I I grew up in Ithaca, um, and um, you know, people are like, "Oh, you're from Ithaca. Why didn't you go to Cornell?" And I'm like, "Cause mm. I'm from Ithaca." And you know, I I didn't. Um, I, I I'm of two minds about this. One is I you know I just did better in history and English in school than I did in science. I love math, and I really mm -hmm. I I don't want to brag, but I did pretty well in math. Um, but it just what like my you know, my interests are were social studies and English, and those were the classes that I really excelled in. But mm. just as every Catholic is not a priest and oh, yeah. every Jew is not a rabbi, right. when I see myself as like I don't, I'm not a scientist as a job, but it is my worldview, and I think there's a way to sort of incorporate that into your life, even if you're not in a lab every day. And it's still the way that I assess what, you know, try to assess. I mean, I'm human, I'm imperfect, but it's the way I try to, you know, assess reality from fiction. And it's the way I sure. try to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And it, it still gives me an enormous thrill. And I read a lot of popular science books and, you know, I, I feel like it's really interesting to me, but I think it's like any philosophy you may, you know, you may be a Buddhist, but not a monk. Yeah, sure. You have, and I, I'm sure you know this, but it was just a remarkable coincidence. You have a chapter a little bit. You speak about March fourth. Yes. In the book that's yes. like a like a like a command to March fourth. Yes. yes. And uh, I didn't know you. I'm sure you know this, or you have to know this. It, it would be amazing to me if you didn't know this. But in your dad's book, Pale Blue Dot, he talks about a planetary alignment. On, yes. Do yes, you know that? in, in one thousand nine hundred fifty-three BC. Okay, yeah. Well, I figured you knew yes. that. I, I ran yes, across. It's it, I was like, there. wow. I think it's, it's in there. It, it. Um, I think it's in there because I talk about. I. I, I sort of. I talk about March fourth playfully as this idea of a day yeah. you could, um, like almost like a day of atonement where you take. Yeah, you talked about repentance. Of yourself. Right. Exactly. Like yeah. re repentance and and a find a way to march forth. And what was so amazing. And that footnote in Pale Blue Dot mm -hmm. is that in ancient China, they totally, they took a look at what this new information was and they completely changed their view of the cosmology that was available mm. to them. And they marched forth instead of clinging 
to what they had believed before. They yeah. said, okay, we have new information. We're going to go forward. And I really admire that. And I think that's something that each of us personally, philosophically, politically yeah. is worth doing. So what, you know, your, your reference to atonement and repentance in that book was really yeah. interesting. How would you incorporate the, the concept, the, the theistic concepts of atonement and repentance within a scientific worldview? How do you accommodate that? Well, I think one of the things, and my dad wrote about this, my parents wrote about this, one of the things that's so amazing about science is if you discover that everything that you believe and everything that the people who st whose shoulders you stand on believed was wrong, you mm. have done a heroic act, right? Celebrated. And sure, I mean, human beings, scientists are human beings, and sometimes they are jerks. Um, like all of us, um, yeah. and they don't want to admit that they were wrong. But the yeah. goal is new information, and you say, "Okay, that's to you're right. I'm sorry. You know, I, I was totally mistaken about mm. that, and now I can clearly see that you know the Earth goes around the Sun and not the other way around, or whatever it is. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that that's a value. And I think that there's something about that that we can. You know that it doesn't require um i mean i think i don't think it requires um faith to think to, to and i think that science actually really encourages this idea that saying oh i was wrong about that now i get it is a really good thing and then just letting whatever it was that you thought before that you now realize isn't true go and that that's a really positive thing and nothing to be ashamed of yeah all right, so this is a classic okay. question that comes up in our book club all the time that you can settle once and for all. So. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm not, so, so that we hear this all the time. It goes back and forth and it, it brings up a lot of uh, to do and we don't go very, very far past it once it comes up sometimes. But so does science, dis, does science disprove theism or God's existence? I don't think it disproves it. I just think that it it's not doesn't provide any supporting evidence. And so, if you're looking for evidence as the pathway to understanding, because human beings, you know, it's really how do we know what's real or not if 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 it's if we don't have a way of testing it, mm. you know? And um, and I think that it's not that it disproves it it just hasn't provided any any supporting evidence um thus far so okay we are going to go to another yeah. question and this will be from one of our atheist members okay. of the book club i think this is chris this is chris bielfus he's one of our atheist members he's a regular attender and he has a question for you hi sasha my name is chris thank you for taking our questions now, one issue that's been brought up in our group multiple times is how non-believers can address questions of morality without some sort of God-given framework. I was curious how your father taught you how to be a moral person without referring to divine authority, scripture, or anything of that nature. Great question. So this is, this is my perspective. Every one of us, whether you're religious or secular, there is a framework of do's and don'ts, you know, your the laws of where you live, mm. um, you know, your rules when you're a teenager in your house, and every one of us is deciding which rules to follow and which not to. I mean, n you know, nobody is freaking out about, you know, it's like, okay, thou shall not kill, great call, agree, yeah. everyone, that <laughs> definitely, good let's one. do that. It's a good but one. But then it's yeah. like, okay, well, like wearing clothing of mixed fibers, is that real? You know, there's stuff there that's like, you know, the, the, you know, working on the, um, um, yeah, you're going into the Old Testament, the right. Old Testament laws. Right. Yeah. But there's yeah. things that were, you know, that, that any, any, you know, more and more, I think, you know, just like anything, like, do you sometimes jaywalk? Do you sometimes go five miles above the speed limit? Do you sometimes, you know, do five? Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like every one of us has an internal compass that is, you know, um, navigating what we think is really right. We have some degree of empathy. We have some imagination to think, oh, if I do this to this other person, that will be really unpleasant for them. Or mm -hmm. that nagging feeling when you're like, oh, I don't want to go to this thing, but if I don't yeah. go, this person will be really, really hurt. 
you know, we all have that in, inside of us, whether or not we um, believe that anyone's supervising. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, there are people who, you know, in, historically who have been very devout, who have done terrible things. And there have been people who don't believe, who have spent their life giving to others and, and trying to make the world a better place. And I just think there are, there's not, you know, I mean, my parents taught me to be empathetic and kind and grateful for how lucky I was and to remember that the fact that I grew up very privileged um, was, I was extremely lucky and that other people were not so privileged and that it's my duty then to try to make the world a little fairer and to try to do right by, by other people who maybe didn't have it as good as I did growing up. And I don't think that that is, I don't think that you have to, I just don't, I, for me, that, those ideas never came from a religious place. It just came from a place of empathy. And mm -hmm. I think that every one of us has that in us to some degree. And sure, some people are sociopaths and they don't, but that's not yeah. because they don't believe, you know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. because there's something else going on. Yeah. Very good. We have, uh, one more question, I think, from uh, another of our atheist guests, and this this was something that we touched on briefly when we started talking. Uh, I think okay, Jim, okay. Jim is Jim Hall. Uh, Jim Hall. He's uh, uh, he runs the Atheist Edge uh, YouTube channel, and uh, he has a question about your dad's position on religion. Hi, Sasha. It's Jim Hall here, host of a webcast called Atheist Edge. My question for you is this. Carl seemed hesitant to identify as an atheist, and some reporters have even indicated that he rejected the label agnostic, although many might describe him as something of a pantheist given his deep reverence and awe for the universe. Philosophically, atheism is best described as a direct no answer to the question, do gods exist? By this strict definition, neither I and I would guess your father are atheists. However, there is a colloquial definition that is simply a lack of belief in deities. Do you think Carl had reluctance to identify as an atheist because he adhered only to the more formal definition and disregarded the common parlance? Or was it possibly that he maybe thought the term atheist was too provocative or confrontational and didn't fit his gentle nature? Uh, thanks so much for answering my question and take care. Well, so it's a great question and he did have a really gentle nature. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, he was a scientist and that, and it, again, maybe there's a word missing here for what it's called when your worldview is science. And I would just say he would say that he would withhold belief without evidence. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I don't think that, I don't think that he w would, um, have described himself as being an atheist in the sense of having total conviction that there was no God, but yeah. just the idea that we don't have any evidence to support that and human beings have the tendency to, um, you know, without without looking at the things that we can measure and prove, um, it's hard to know what's real. And that's what he was really, truly interested in was what was true, what was verifiably, provably true. Mm. Um, and that's that's what his life's work was was about, was understanding that and celebrating it because yeah. It, for him and for me, the things that, that we've been able to discover through the scientific method as a species are so often more astonishing and breathtaking than, uh, than anything that we have, we humans come up with on our own. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sasha, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to somebody that it basically, thank you so much. I'm like a nobody. This was great. No, I'm stop. So First of all, don't be so hard <laughs> on yourself, Daniel. And I'm so happy you invited me on the show. This is so fun. I love that you guys do this po um, podcast and this book club is so cool. Yeah. It's, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy we got to talk about this stuff. But to me, yeah. it's the most interesting stuff to talk about. Um, so I want to I want to conclude with a question. Sometimes we ask our guests. It's It's just for you to offer your perspective. And I yes. see from reading your book, and I think I, it was a quote, and I can't remember it verbatim from Contact, um, but your dad's position and your own position on who Jesus was, and, you know, without any pushback from me, I just want to hear what, what dad thought oh, of Jesus so and, and what you thought of, what you think of, of Christ. 
Oh, and then we'll, um, we'll wrap it up and you can have your. I mean, I really, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I would have to really delve into some of the historical data, but in terms of somebody, an iconic person who, um, you know, I mean, was like really, um, I think by modern standards would be considered a really enlightened hippie. Um, and I really <laughs> admire that. And somebody who really, you know, I think that's a really wonderful thing. And uh -huh. um, somebody who really was interested in treating people equally and um, who, uh, you know, didn't, didn't see a lot of the distinctions um, between groups that are so central to yes. um, the way we organize ourselves today, um, sadly. But your dad, in, from the contact quote, your dad, your dad was not a, a mythicist. He did believe in the existence of Jesus of Nazareth as a, as a person, anyway. Correct? I think so. I don't. I'm gonna have to ask my mom. I don't know. I I think so. We have to. <laughs> we have to. Yeah. Well, I have to. I have to get back to. Yeah, I'm, I'm careful. I wrote a. I wrote a small paper on him uh, about his religious beliefs. I wanted to have a nice, uh, a, a good, concise background of, of that, and I didn't want to pull from the fiction and think that was his statement, but it seemed to be, I wish I had the quote with me. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, you'll have to let me know what, what your mom thinks about that. Yeah. And, uh, I'll one find more out. Yeah, all right. That'd be great. One more secret squirrel question. Do you know when Cosmos is coming out? I do know, you're, but I'm not saying. You're not supposed to tell. Well, I figured that. I thought I would ask and just throw it out there. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much, Daniel. You're welcome. And when, when this is all finished, and I will send you uh, links, and I will send you a link to the podcast that will come out uh, sometime this week, and then the video, we will be meeting on your dad's birthday. So um, any last, you can say hello to our, our Atheist Christian Book Club, and any any last thoughts you want to say? We'll wrap hello, Atheist Christian Book Club. I think it's so great, and I think that you do this, and I think that um, the whole country and the whole world would be a lot better off if there were a lot more um, theistic and atheistic book clubs and groups and social gatherings and we were a little less siloed and a little more interested in discussion and friendly debate yes. and uh, intellectual intellectual uh, conversations. Yes, Sasha has been wonderful. Thank you for sending me a copy of the book. Uh, I sent you a copy of our Cosmos book to New York. I don't know if you got it or not. Yes, I got it. I haven't. I just got home the other day, okay. so I haven't had a chance to read it. But it's okay. Here. Thank All you right. so much. Just tweet me when you if you have a question or if you think it's crazy. Just let me know. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. All right, Daniel. Sasha. So nice to meet you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye.